possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. Oh, and there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello and welcome to the RTU GAA podcast. Um, Mikey Stafford here. This is the football edition. We're going to have a look back on what was a very uh, exciting weekend of provincial final action in two cases out of three. And actually it's the third uh, slightly more, um, slightly less exciting match that we're actually going to reflect on here because um, I'm delighted to say that we are joined by uh, Westmead, former Westmead footballer John Canellan. Uh, who wrote an open letter um, on social media at the weekend in the wake of Dublin's um, rather bloodless win over me that has got quite a lot of traction. Um, so with us, with me and John to discuss that is as always Rory O'Neill. Um, Kevin McStay is back with us again. And um, we have Conor McKeown from the Herald uh, Irish Independent, uh, Independent News and Media. Uh, we'll give you as many titles as possible, Conor. How are we all doing, gentlemen? Are we well? Good, good Mikey. Mikey. Very good. Good, good Mikey. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> John, uh, you told us just there that you have a four-week-old child at home. Uh, congratulations. And this open letter of yours has certainly won you some time out of the house, which I'm sure you're going to be. You're going to pay back for royally in not too long. Um, but your letter has struck a chord, be it timing, be it the fact that the person writing it has actually played in a Leinster final against Dublin. Um, there's a few reasons. And obviously, it was a very well-written letter. I'm not going to read it. It's nearly 1,500 words long, so I'm not going to read it out. But... Um, you know, you kind of, the nub of it, I think, is two paragraphs. Uh, the committee established under Sean Kelly recognised that the GA in Dublin was under threat and the jump to immediate and affirmative action. The GA is fall, failing to recognise or is willfully obtuse to the fact that the GA is and has been under serious threat in all of the other counties in Leinster for quite some time now. So I guess, just tell us your thought process. A, why now have you written the letter having, you know, been aware of this as the rest of us have been for quite some time? And why you feel so strongly about it as to, you know, to put yourself out there, it's a, it's a brave enough thing to do because your views, while not controversial, you know, they're not, they're not universally accepted either. <laughs> yeah, um, look, it's, it's, I suppose, f- touching firstly on, on kind of my, my motivation behind writing the letter, it's, uh, I mean, it's something that I, I won't say, I, I didn't have it written, I didn't have it in the back pocket ready to go, but it's something that, uh, you know, I've kind of been banging my head up a brick wall, it, it seems like, for, for a little while now. I mean, I wouldn't have a huge following or anything on social media or, or anything like that. But I think when I finished up playing in, in 2017, um, like, not, I, I, I know players put out these retirement uh, statements or whatever, you know, like, I, I far be it for me to, to do that. But I had something that I wanted to say. And in around then, I just posted something to say that I'd be, I, I, I was retiring and uh, I suppose the gist of that post was that, you know, I made my debut in 2006, uh, kind of as a naive 17 year old, having uh, two years previously seen Westmead um, lift the Delaney Cup, you know. So when I um, joined the Westmead panel uh, in two years later, winning Leinster was obviously an ambition of mine and it was it was a live ambition of mine and, and, and a realistic goal to set or whatever so i think just during the duration of my uh, inter-county career now i i emigrated for three years as well like i wouldn't have half the miles on the clock that some people are putting the same level of commitment that that some people did in in west new jersey but during the currency of my career we've seen the leinster championship go from something that was a realistic goal for every county player, almost every county player in Leinster from Westmead, from Leash, Offaly, Kildare, Mead, to going to a position where now, as I kind of alluded to in my letter, um, the Leinster Championship is really dead. It's a dead rubber every single year. Like, I mean, we talk about, I suppose, competitive balance and, and you know, uh, uncertainty of outcome. There is absolutely no uncertainty of outcome when the uh, first ball is thrown in in the Leinster Championship like and, and and what's the worst thing about it we've had some ding dong battles over the last number of years against against Offaly against Leash uh, against Mead against Kildare and you know I think really kind of showcase that 
while the standard in Leinster may have slipped outside of Dublin, there are good games to be played in Dublin. But, you know, that unfortunately, I mean, if, if a young kid is, is talking to me, he's saying, oh, you know, what's it like to play for Westmead? Would you, would you, would you encourage, would, would you honestly encourage them to say, oh, yeah, look, give up 36 hours of your week to go and train uh, with, with Westmead? I mean, it's, it's difficult for, to, in all sincerity, in sincerity to say that to them. So that, that's kind of the motivation behind, behind writing the letter. Um, and I suppose, as, as I said, I, and the more and more I've, I've kind of, over the last 48 hours, the feedback that I've got, um, people have rightly said to me, like, I know, you, John, you're focused on Leinster. I, I, I'm from Leinster. But, you know, this is across the country as well. Um, and, yeah, and, and I've, I've kind of outlined where, where I feel that the Dublin dominance has, has stemmed from. And I should I should say kind of at the outset of this debate, like if there are a couple of things that I think we can all agree on and anyone listening to this can agree on, and that's number one, that the last two Dublin teams, I'll say two Dublin teams because that's really, we're seeing a new team over the last couple of years, but they're the greatest team to ever play the game. And mm. another, Stephen Cluxton is the greatest goalkeeper, probably the greatest captain to ever play the game. Conor Callahan is a generational talent. Um, and the Dublin County Board, the Dublin players, and the Dublin supporters are in absolutely no way to blame for where we are now. And the last point that I'd say is probably that the rest of us, yeah, fair enough, we do have to do better. But I think that structures around funding, around uh, championship structures, can help us also as well. And I just don't think it's been done. Yeah. C- Connor, to come to you on that, I think it, it's good that John you know, added that very important caveat there that he's not in any way anti-Dublin because the problem with this debate, and I would say this debate, you, you can say on social media, but in the media as well, because there's plenty of people who are kind of uh, fairly entrenched on both sides. It's a, it's a difficult conversation to have. Like prime time were pilloried for producing a program on Dublin finances and domination in the days after the five in a row. And you could argue that why did you have to do it in the days after five in a row and, you know, Donna Diamond, the, the editor, the, you know, the head of RV Current Affairs says, because it was current affair at the time, which is a very fair point. But it, it's a difficult conversation to have because it's people on one side don't want to see the view of the people on the other side. No, I think you're right that it gets very entrenched very quickly, Mikey. Um, and I think every debate in the GAA, you know, is being debated by people who have allegiances to counties. But um, I, I suppose the, the, the thing that comes very quickly to the fore in this debate is the, the sort of development funding that Dublin get, and it's disproportionate to the rest of the country in terms of the amount. Um, and I just think it's very obvious that there's an issue now. Um, but I, I just wonder whether by addressing the issue, we're actually finding the, the root cause of it. Like, I'm not sure if you diminish Dublin's development funding, that the strength of the senior football team, which is basically the issue here, is going to dilute in any way over the short to medium term and possibly even long term. hundred percent. But, but, but I think what will happen is that it will drastically and radically reduce the Dublin County Boards and the GAA's capacity to promote hurling and football in the highest concentration of population in the country. Now, I understand completely why people outside of Dublin find it hard to get exercised about participation rates in Dublin. But equally, I can understand why the governing body would. So that's the issue. I think. Connor, 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 can I just make one very quick point? 20 years ago, when this was first mooted, if they had not acted, and Dublin was a GAA wasteland currently, they would be being pilloried for exactly the opposite of what they did do. Yeah, They'd no, be was, getting absolutely, you know, so I, I you know, sorry, 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 go on, sorry. sorry no, sorry, Rory, no, you, 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 okay. I, I actually I spoke to Liam Neil about this on Monday and he was, I think, the, the Leinster Games chairman in, when Sean Kelly was president of the GAA and he made that exact point. You know, and, and this is what happens in the GAA. You, you fix one problem and it becomes a success and then others spring <laughs> up overnight. I look, I, I, the issue here is, you know, when, like, when you're looking at this, the ideal situation is you're going to bring other teams up to that level. Now, the rhetoric out there that it's up to everybody else to get their act together and come up to Dublin's level. 
Whether you agree with that or not, it's not happening. So I think it's incumbent upon the GAA at central level to intervene. But, and this is another point that I'd like to make and as sort of delicately as possible, but simply giving county boards more money, I don't think will solve the problem because there are certain county boards that aren't structured in such a way to use that funding in the most productive way. In, in 2016, Leinster Council published a report uh, and it was into how a million euro had been used in five different counties for the advancement of hurling. So it was 40,000 a year over five years for the counties were Leinster counties. Um, and they basically commissioned a report. It was a follow the money report into how the money had been used. Um, and I'm just gonna actually read out, and, and, and this is not, by the way, to castigate or pillory any county board because county boards have enough to be doing organized games. But the point that I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make is that the, this debate quickly descends to take money off Dublin, give it to other county boards. And I don't think that that is necessarily addressing the issue because the issue of high performance, which is now what the Dublin footballers do, it's what you know, the Kenny hurlers do, it's what the Kerry footballers do, that's a completely different discipline. To organize that in terms of coaches, to oversee coaches, to have structures and a flow between all your elite teams from you know, underage development level up to senior, what that requires is, an, is a huge amount of expertise. And with the best will in the world, there are certain county boards out there that just don't have that expertise. Now, I'm not saying leave them sort of rot, leave them to kind of sail further and further adrift of the level that's being set by this team. What I'm saying is whatever kind of intervention uh, the GAA ultimately come up with, and I think they probably should, it needs to be a much more hands-on approach rather than simply taking from one budget and dropping it into another budget. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's a fair point, Kevin. And you have written on this in your column a lot and you've spoken about it quite sensibly. And I know you, 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 are, to, or you were last year when you spoke to Declan Welly for a piece for the RTE website, uh, you were an advocate of some form of pooling of resources to, if, if nothing else, take the strain off um, travel expenses, which are another natural advantage that Dublin have, which you know they can't be blamed Huge. for being, a, you know, a county with um, the only functioning public transport service and quite a quite a small landmass for quite a large population. Mm -hmm. But you were saying, if nothing else happened, you know, you could take the strain off Mayo, Cork. Kerry and these other counties that have huge travel expense bills mm. by some form of pooling. Is that still your view on this? It, it is. One and of, of course, of course, this year we've had um, the perfect uh, environment in which to uh, check the expenditures because uh, everything is down to just very basic levels. Mm. And the GA told us it, it was a very complex model, couldn't be done. The idea that Mayo or Donegal or Western Seaboard counties couldn't vouch their mileage or their food, and the idea that that's a complex uh, equation um, is beyond me. Uh, civil service have been doing it for 130 years or 100, whatever years. But anyway, um, the problem with, I, I just want to broaden it out. I haven't changed my position on that. And you see, the problem with this debate we're having, Mikey, is I think the five of us, even though we're coming from all different angles, actually agree. I agree with everything Connor says there now and what John said before him. Like, it's all very sensible stuff. Um, but Connor touched on a, on, a, on a point just at the end there, that taking money off Dublin and handing it out, that would be utter madness because he is 100% correct. There are so many, so many boards that are not geared up, county boards are not geared up uh, to make the connections. And you only have to go in uh, to see that. And that's not, as they say down here, throwing asparagus at anybody uh, or casting asparagus at anybody. So the, um, the, idea, the idea that that would be the solution would be preposterous. It is not. So what I prefer to in dig into is what 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 is the common denominator that has what's the golden thread linking the Dublin Renaissance? Because remember, Dublin were a basket case for quite a while too. They were daft. They were coming. They were going. They were best. They were no good at it for a long time. They figured it out then eventually. So let's let's try and ask ourselves that question. Now I think the solution is actually actually one... Kevin. Kevin, sorry to interrupt again. 
when the when the first strategic report came out and they were actually the first time they were proposing to split Dublin, Dublin were absolute shite. Yeah, because this came out back in two thousand and two, so yeah. it is gas that like the conversation is becoming much more toxic now when they're utterly dominant. But sorry, yeah. sorry. No, no, no. It's okay. And I, again, I agree with that, Rory. So you're all making sensible points, but I want to get back to what is the golden thread, as Rumpole would say it in 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 the defence. What's the golden thread? And it's this: the population is a given. That's a demographic advantage that needs complex thought, right? The, 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 the Dublin population, you know, we've all moved towards the east now. It's a massive advantage. And with the team hubbed uh, in Dublin City, their travel and all the accompanying um, advantages that bestows. But I go back to all these things. I said to you loads of times, Rory, when we're discussing this. If you come up with a brilliant idea in business or in life or anything, and you, put, you don't put good people around it, it won't work. Come up with a middling idea and, st- and put good people around it, it probably will work. So I have always pointed towards the John Costello era of Dublin. Now, not every county has a CEO. In fact, Cork only recently, when the, well, their biggest operating unit, I would say, in the country, only very recently got to that I level uh, and appointed one. Now, to me, John has been the golden thread that the strategy was executed the money was used wisely. Uh, the linkage between the teams and high performance uh, and the, the absolute insistence that good coaches, good strength and conditioning, that the top, not good, the top standard that they could possibly get. Like the likes of Kieran Whelan been in with the 16s, Desi Farrell with the 18s. And then like in other counties, that's not happening. Like I could go to a lot of counties and tell you the managers, like the ex-players are not, are not getting involved to that level. And then why don't they? Because they think, well, it's not been run to the sort of standard that wants to go off playing golf. Hi, uh, come in there, Martin. Uh, sorry, Nana. Just before, I suppose we, like, I just I, with something that Connor has raised, and obviously you, 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 you agree. Um, like for us to, I mean, you're completely right. And I was on off the ball uh, yesterday morning, and that was a major point that I made: is that not every county board has a John Costello. And this is not to belittle the work that's being done by county boards uh, across the yeah, country. Agreed. Not every yeah. county board. Now, look, you know what it's like in Roscommon, Mayo, Galway in the West, okay, as well as Leinster. We broaden this discussion, right? County boards up and down the country run by volunteers who are very, very many of them are well-qualified uh, people to do the job, right? But they're completely distracted by fundraising. Fundraising mm. is almost 99% of their job, okay? Dublin don't have that distraction. Dublin have all of this um, money that's been provided through sponsorship, which they deserve enormous credit for raising. They have uh, income streams into their clubs through membership, which is absolutely off the wall in comparison to a club uh, down in Galway or, or a club in Athlone like, like our own. Like Kilmacud Crokes, to use them as an example, I used them yesterday. Their family membership is 650 euro. They have 4,800 members. They're, they're, the lowest membership that they have there is a student one for 160 euro. They have 4,800 members. Now, I'll leave it to someone smarter than myself to do the maths than that, okay? In Athlone, our family membership is 120 euro. Our student membership is 40. So this is where we see, and we can't separate all of these clubs from county because the county stars come from the club setup and the club coaching and games development, okay? Now, just, that's, that's like, I mean, for other county boards, okay? Firstly, if we could have a CEO like John Costello appointed to every, every, every county board, right? That, that's, that's one step that can be taken to ensure that the money is spent in the way that it should be, okay? Now, clubs themselves, like, I mean, in Dublin, like I, I hear what you're saying about you can't you can't defund the dubs and, and that that was a quote that well not a quote but uh, uh, something that was taken from my interview with, with off the ball should, should we defund the dubs and maybe it was my own fault the way the way I put it but what would be wrong for instance with games development funding being provided on a means tested basis okay so we're in Athlone all right someone from Crow Park or Leinster Council comes down to Athlone. 
they look at the schools around the area, they look at the teams that we have playing at underage level, and they say, right, we think that you need one or two GPOs, okay? Right, let's look at your finances now and see what the affordability is. What can you bring to the table? The current model for the GAA across the board, okay, is that if a club can provide 50% of the salary for a games promotion officer, Crow Park will match that by 50% or Leinster Council will match that by 50%. Now that's the same whether I'm Kilmacud or whether I'm Colliery GAA in West Maine. And that's, that's just, that, that's not feasible across the board, okay? Like, it's, it's just, to have a one-size-fits-all model across the way is just not feasible. And while I, I accept you're saying that to take the money from Dublin would be madness, but there are, there are clubs in Dublin sitting on massive, massive cash reserves, earning massive, massive money from membership and sponsorship deals. Like, why can we not go in there and say, right, fair enough, you need one GPO, but you can actually afford to pay that yourself. Like, I, 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 I actually think that on a means-tested basis, taking some of that games development funding from Dublin clubs and redistributing where it's badly, badly needed across the country in Cork, Galway, Water, Waterford, Westmead, Sligo, Mayo, Roscommon, that, like, that has to be part of the solution. But As, to, say that, to say that, John, is to, you're, you're almost suggesting that they, they're not needed in Dublin. And as Connor made the point earlier, you, you do almost have to separate the high performance from the social aspect of the GA here. And well, that's where it gets it, very, 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 but, just one second, but, that's where but, it gets really tricky sorry. because um, so from one social aspect of the GA is that everybody deserves to play and everybody deserves a chance to be able to play GAA. And if there's not a games development officer below in a tiny club, I take an example of Geraldine's who are like stuck between Kilmacud and Kula and everybody else in South Dublin, they're tiny. If they didn't have a games development officer who was going into the schools, everybody would go play for Cabin Teeley and they'd go play rugby for Black Rock and they'd be lost to the GA. But then the other side of the social argument is that the GA is a social movement and surely, surely the GA should be more socialist than, say, the NFL, where all income is pooled and, you know, the Cincinnati Pizza. Bengals make as much money from the pooled the pool as the New England Patriots. So it, it's a really hard circle to square that the GAA has many responsibilities in many places. And it seems that, you know, to, to untie this knot is incredibly difficult. Yeah, yeah, I accept that. Um, but I mean, it, it keeps coming back to the point that some clubs can afford to do that, can afford to go out into the school and drive participation, which in turn drives membership income for them. And some, some clubs in Dublin, I'm talking about the super clubs in Dublin. I'm not talking about your Geraldines and your Ranala Gales and these newly formed clubs. Mm. There are super clubs in Dublin which are in receipt of games development funding, which could 100%, which they have affordability themselves. And in fact, what a situation that you're finding, and I know, you know I won't name the clubs, but I know of two clubs on the south side of Dublin that... They have one games directing games director directing officer. I'm not sure exactly what it's called, which is uh, part of his head of heady games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah part, part, part of his salary is funded directly by um, the uh, GA. I think fifty percent. Okay, off their own bat, this same club has um, two masters qualified strength and conditioning, sports science, and nutrition um, uh, graduates employed on a full-time basis working for them, which is solely off the bat of that, of that club. But, but yet, down in Athlone, in Westmead, we still haven't adopted the Games uh, Promotion Officer mm. model yet. We're still, now, that is happening, and credit has to go to Leinster. They're, they are moving in the right direction there, but it still hasn't happened yet. So um, I, yeah. I don't accept the argument that clubs can't afford to drive participation, mm. which is the primary ethos of the GAA, that they can't do that themselves without centrally administered funds. Um, none of this would be a problem for anybody in Athlone, Rory, or uh, Cahir Savine, or anywhere else, if the, you know, if the figurehead, if the, if the top of the Dublin pyramid wasn't, you know, milling all around them and, you know, winning 10 straight Leinster titles and looking for a six straight All-Ireland. And while some of those All-Irelands have been won by the narrowest of margins and been won by replay, they've still been won and they've pretty much been tested once a year. And I don't think 
John's suggestion isn't unfair, but I don't think taking the game development officer money away from any of those big Dublin clubs will, as Connor points out, cut the head off the snake. Like the, the not, major problem not, here yeah. and the GA shop window is it's inter-county tournaments, it's inter-county All-Ireland Championship, and it's in danger of becoming a, a, you know, a one-man band. Like, yeah, and, 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 and as Connor said, he's spot on. Like, in the, like, no matter how you shift the money around in the short or the medium term is going to make no difference to the dominance that Dublin are enjoying now at senior football level. Like, to go back to an, an earlier point that John made in relation to, like, we, because initially when the dominance first occurred, we were told it's once in a generation. And I do actually think, in fairness, it's a really important point that John made around the the whole situation that like I mean, if you look at the 2011 team I'm just looking at it here you've got Stephen Cluxton Michael Fitzsimons and James McCarthy that's all that's left Cluxton obviously in you know nearly 40 years of age so he he won't well, well who knows so like it is this is not this is more than cyclical now this is uh, this is this is this wasn't just a once in a generation team yeah, and I think one thing that I would find slightly disconcerting about the whole issue is that there's a tendency to sort of stick our heads in the sand a wee bit. Like, Kevin, you were with us last year when we did a piece on this uh, in advance of the Leinster football final, and you know how difficult it was at that time, even just to get people to come out and speak on the, on the, on the topic and how reticent people were to almost admit that there was a problem. And I'm even detecting that now still. I think that's, that's the biggest shame for me. There is a problem here. Well, you need to it, yeah. you need to recognise that there is a problem. I mean, yeah. people make comparisons to the Kilkenny side of the last decade. But we all knew. You see, I often hear this other argument put forward as well, that teams need to get up to Dublin standard in the same way that teams needed to get up to Kilkenny standard. That's totally, that's a total misnomer. Teams didn't get up to Kilkenny standard. What happened with Kilkenny was it was a once in a generation team. And once Tommy Walsh and JJ Delaney and Henry Shefflin and two or three others went, Kilkenny came back to the pack. The teams didn't get up to their standard because it was, it was simply a standard that you couldn't attain. Yeah. There's no like that because they were, they were that good. The problem with Dublin is every, people are being told we need to get up. To, you're not going to be able to achieve it. They have huge advantages. They've always had those advantages. We can accept that. I think what the problem for the GAA is they've created a monster it's an, and they now don't know what to do. I think yeah, that's, the, that's I, what that's... I, 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 can I say, Rory, that um, the, 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 the debate we're having is so broad now at the minute. Like, you know, we, we've, yeah. I, I don't think we could get... I don't think we can drill into any fine detail uh, because no matter what we do now, there's going to be a 10-year lag time before anyone would oh, catch up anyway. So yeah. I, I prefer to concentrate on, on, the re, on the realities, we'll say, of yeah. it. Like I was listening with interest to Pat T and talking to Sean Moore the other day, um, where he's talking about, well, it, yeah, it might be in trouble. And I accept it could be in trouble. I, it is, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's to me, no, like, you that's, know, like, yeah. like I'll give you a couple of things. And I, I, this was just, like you're talking about Dublin and three lads from 2011. The 2019 Leinster final, Dublin made eight changes to their starting lineup last Saturday night. More than half their team didn't play in the 2019 Leinster final. Okay, so that just gives you a sense of it. And I certainly didn't see any d- diminution in their in their in their in their Jack, ability Jack, or quality. Jack, Jack Kevin Jack McCaffrey is one of the best Gaelic footballers yeah. I have ever seen. I've ever seen play the game. Yeah. He decides to take a sabbatical and. Life that would be on. a mortal blow, a mortal blow to anybody else. Yeah. To them. You don't even bat an eyelid. Life troubles <laughs> on. But you know this point that you're making about Kilkenny, and the same, I've heard the same point said, I'd all correct itself, sure, having Kerry been dominating Munster. Mm. But the bit that's always left out about Kerry dominating Munster is that they're playing against non football counties every year. Yeah. Like up yeah. in Leinster, they're at least their football counties for the majority. Take out Kilkenny, Wexford, perhaps, and you could toss a coin there, maybe. But so you're expected, it's, Dublin should have it more difficult. But the, the, I suppose the point I keep making is that why don't we do a few immediate fixes? Now, I was writing this week about, at a minimum, like it's hard to believe, but I'll repeat this statistic. In 1890, Leash played Dublin for the first time in the Leinster Championship. In the 100 and, 
30 can do me maths right here. In the 130 years since, there have been 35 matches between Leash and Dublin. None of them have ever been played in Leash. Okay? Now, just think about that for a second. Like, why are we, like, why are the two All Ireland's up in Crow Park? Why are these Leinster matches not on a home and away basis? And if, if it's not about money, can't Dublin play Wicklow down in Ockram this year? And if they're playing them next year, it's back up in wherever Dublin want to play it. Why are all these matches? Like, I'll give you the final point, because I'm on a bit of a rant now. Three years ago, Leash drew Dublin in Port Leash. You'll remember. Mm-hmm. And what did they do? They took it out of a football ground and they put it into Nolan Park. And they said, oh, that was a bad mistake. Pat Tien was saying, you know, we, we, we thought the crowd would be much bigger. Well, that is not true. The reason it was taken out of Port Leash and put into Nolan Park, as I understand it, is the seating arrangements. There was more seating available in Nolan Park, and therefore you could the get... the season ticket a, holders, that was right. Correct, or whatever. So it's all this all nonsense that's thrown in to fog up the, 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 the conversation. Let's do what's doable. The venue thing could be done immediately and accepted it's, it's by all. It's hard to see the venue thing making... A it would. Oh, no, it would. It would, Mikey. It, it definitely does. And again, I was that soldier. We played okay. Dublin. We played Dublin. Yeah, um, yeah. Kevin, Kevin, Park, Kevin. Got Kevin. murdered down the country. Yeah, like Kevin, like, 100%. 100%. Like, uh, the venue thing everyone keeps saying isn't a big thing. They've lost Massive. two championship matches. They've lost two championship matches in 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. You talk to Paul Kerrigan. Paul Kerrigan is a good friend of Paul Kerrigan. And he'll always say to you, like, the big thing when they won their All Ireland back in 2010 their favourite moment was obviously beating Dublin semi-final the first thing he said to you the reason why when you go up there to play them you're the away team make no mistake about it you are playing away from home so why they haven't addressed that but there are other things that they're going to have to look at in the short and the medium term to try and equalise it in some way now I can also accept that this whole notion of splits and the geography and all of that is a very, very difficult one because you're tampering with. Well, I drew that identity. out, Rory. I think. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I, no, yeah, that's a I think, yeah, yeah. But, 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 and also, I think with what, 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 what you know, because look, I think Dublin GA people, by and large, are not stupid people. You know, they're they're all fairly decent, solid GA yeah, heads, and, and yeah, <laughs> you know, so like. Like they understand, but like they, the flip side that it would often be say, okay, you're talking about splitting Dublin. Well, why don't Sligo and Leitrim combine? Uh, you know, why don't Carlo and Leash come together? Because that's the flip side of them being asked, well, yeah. why are you asking us to? You know? I think, so, I think, Rory, it's wasted energy. It's not something I'd even, yeah. it's not going to happen. I, I, like I, Dublin I, have to stay as I one dis- I disagree, Kevin, and I'd like to get. Connor's opinion on it because yeah. as far as I'm concerned at this stage as you say the train has left the station the Frankenstein's monster is out of the cage whatever you want to say I, like I, I and do you think there's any I, I think it's inevitable if there's going to be any kind of a sensible GA inter-county championship Connor, can, can you see a Dunleary rat down a Fingal a Dublin City in the next 10 years I, I think it'll happen is it hard enough, Mikey, which voting uh, constituency to go to now without knowing which team you're supposed to be having an eye on? But I, I can't see it at the moment, Mikey. I really can't. And I think it would be a very dangerous thing for the GAA to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like you're talking about, I mean, I don't want to get into talking about brands and these sort of things, but even diluting the, the even taking away the right of people from a particular area to support the county that they grew up in and how they identify, that's the point of, that's, you know, that's, mm. The, the whole sort of modus operandi of the organization. Um, and if you get into splitting organizations, like, do you, and I know this gets trotted out, but then is there, a, is there an argument you made that you, that you start bringing counties together and they have to play yeah. as one entity because you're, again, like you're, you're diluting them. Yeah. And like, I, I know, again, to repeat myself, that it's hard for anybody outside of Dublin to get too excited about you know, increasing participation rates. But at the moment, with the population in Dublin, and given that there are new areas sprouting up all the time in which there are no routes put down for any sport, and there are a lot of people that are coming in and living there from different countries, and they are the communities that the GAA haven't really been able to sort of tap into any great extent. I think the idea of, you know, well, we're in Northwest Dublin, or we're the M50 Gales, or whatever it is, I just think it would be, it would turn people off it too much, and, and I, 
you know, I'm not sure that Kerry want to win their next All Ireland by beating South Dublin or North Dublin either. That's you true. know what I mean? And, and flip and, the coin, Connor. Could you imagine asking Kerry, who've had a fair old domination, I would have to say, over the years, to split? Or asking even my own county, Mayo, to split? There'd be no sense of identity, nothing. It, it won't, it, like, Mikey, you're saying um, it could have. There is nobody involved in this podcast that it will happen in their lifetime. I'll make that, I'll make that, I'll make that uh, both bo- some, like, some, Yeah, something, something that I don't necessarily, I don't think that, I, I don't see that happening either. But I, something that I think maybe, I like, I think they have to start trying things. And I think they have to start trying things soon. I think they can't keep, like, I mean, look, 12 months time, what we're going to be probably facing into a Dublin means Dublin killed their Leinster final. Same thing will probably happen again, lads, you know? And we'll all be hand ringing, and we'll be all saying all oh, Leinster football, and then and then, and so like. But if it's down but, the if it's down the country, Rory, if that match is played in a neutral venue, Hyde Hyde Park or wherever, and it's not all about having eighty thousand, it's fine having thirty thousand in the Hyde, and let's see it happen there, and things will happen. You saw you, you just look at last weekend, things tighten. You know, they're no longer now the home team, as 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 you articulated yourself, etc., and all the other advantages like. You know, kicking freeze into the hill uh, mm. is a lot more difficult than kicking them in to the bacon end in Castle Bar. You know, if that's your home venue or the Black Rock end, if it's that, like these are massive advantages. And people, for some reason, I think it's the easiest fix. And I've been harping on about it for five years now at this stage. John, John do you think, it's crazy. Do you think, do you think yeah. the, the venues can make, would make a difference? Uh, or do you think, as you say in your letter, that the, the, the Provincial championships are a dead duck, and then that leads to the question: Is if the provincial championships are done away with, does the Dublin tra- tra- problem get diluted? Yeah, no, look at I mean, it, it's um, Dublin has shown down through the years that they that they can come out of Crow Park and 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 still give us good beatings down the country. Um, and look at I think Ross Common have been on, on the receiving end of a few good beatings in Hyde Park. Like they, they've they've done it to Tyrone, they've they've done it to everybody outside of Crow Park as well down through the last couple of years. I don't look. I'll be home advantage. It's universally known as it's a competitive advantage. Absolutely, taking them out of Crow Park, hundred percent, particularly in that Super Eight format where there was meant to be one home game, one neutral, one away. Hundred percent, I think they should should be taken out of Crow Park for their for their home game. But I suppose. I know we're talking. We're on the we're on the, the the football podcast here, okay? But like, and again, I keep returning the base to the funds, right? Like, since, for instance, this whole uh, increase in, in games development funding has uh, been pumped into uh, in, into Dublin, right? Like, the ladies are now going for four in a row. I'm correct in that, aren't I? Correct. Yeah. 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 The yeah. Are going yeah. For four in a row. Okay. The hurlers have had. A meteoric rise, right? So in 2006, the hurlers were beaten in the Leinster quarterfinal by Westmead, my own county. Made great progress in hurling, but we're not a hurling kingpin by any stretch of the imagination. They've gone on to win a Division One. They bet Galway in a Leinster final. Uh, in um, uh, they, they, sorry, they bet Galway in a Leinster final. Should have bet Cork that year. Only they had a man sent off. 2013. Yeah. yeah. Kula have won two uh, All Irelands. Okay. Kula also announced their sponsorship with the multinational biotech uh, company. Uh, the, du- the Dublin minor hurlers have played in every Leinster minor, f- minor final from 2014 to 2019, okay? They won it in 2011, 12, 16, and 18. The under-21s have dominated Leinster, all right? So that's the hurling, and that's the, under- the underage hurling, um, the senior hurling, the ladies' football as well, okay? They've competed, they've won... I think 10 out of the last 12 Leinster club finals have been won by Dublin clubs. Like, this, this goes across the board. Like, this, this, this train is, well, like, it really is, it's a juggernaut at this stage, okay? And it all, there's a, a, a sharp rise in Dublin success at ladies, hurling, um, and uh, club level. And it all coincides with the injection of funds in the late 90s and the 2000s, okay? Now, are we going to let this juggernaut just run away so that in 10 years' time, we're sitting here on a podcast and we're saying, God almighty, uh, 10 years ago, they were saying that the club championship will go the same way as, as the Leinster. The All-Ireland series will go the same way as the Leinster. And, and like, is there a dispute that that's the way that those 
uh, formats are heading because I, I don't think I think that's 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 the way it is going. So, and I just I think we've mentioned a couple of things here, like taking the dubs out of Crow Park. Yeah. Now, we're, we're some of us are saying that splitting Dublin is 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 not the answer. Some of us are we're also saying that taking uh, games development fun, funding from Dublin is not the answer. Like, w what is the answer? Like my 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 view. Splitting Dublin may be an inevitability. Now, you'd have to get agreement from Dublin clubs, so I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon at all. So the only thing we're left with then is to redistribute the games development funding to, to counties and clubs around the country that are struggling. And um, I, I, my, my point on that is not that Dublin need this money anymore. I, I just, my point is if we're, discussing the problem, you're discussing a wider problem as in all GEA will become Dublin dominated. I think most people are looking at the conversation from the point of view of the Dublin senior football team. And my point is that that turning off that money isn't going to stop that. But do you think, Kevin, I'll go to you on this. Do you think that- I think John's point is well made though, in oh, terms Jesus. of across yeah, the no, board. No, across no, the board. Yeah, don't yeah. get me wrong. I, I agree with him. But my point is, Kevin, I would say, can the redistribution of that money overturn the natural advantages that Dublin have and which have been successfully to the point of disaster um, activated by the 20 years of funding? Good question. That uh, actually gets to the kernel of it, doesn't it really? And, and I don't have the answer to that, Mikey, but I'll have, I'll have a bit of a stab of it. Um, I, I still think the principal advantage is found in population, not in, not in uh, the, the money. Um, that would be the first point I would make. And that, you know, the more people you have, the likelier it is that you'll find a six foot six guy in the population. That's just life. Um, and I'm the more likely... That either, Kevin. That's a good point, well made. Um, the, the money side of it, yes, you'd have to think it would markedly improve the um, situation. But then you put in an immediate caveat only if it was wisely and strategically and property, properly utilised. And now we're back to where John and we all were and Connor at the beginning. You have to get quality people that are going to drive this whole strategy. Um, like nearly every county has a strategic plan. They're all lovely, glossy magazines. But it's the execution, the implementation of the plan has always been, has always been the dodgy ground uh, for everybody. And okay, but where should the onus be on um, who appoints that person? Like Crow Park, definitely. Mm -hmm. And, and Crow Park do person. appoint them. They, they, they do, like, I mean, I'm familiar with the interview process and so on. They have oversight um, and eventually, essentially they sign off on it because they're, they're providing a lot of the, the funds and the payments for them. Um, but uh, you have to have a top fella. And, you know, fellas of the calibre of John Coslow and Kevin O'Donovan and these guys and so on, like they don't, you know, they're out there, but you have to make it attractive uh, to bring them in. I, I think every county can make significant gains if they were well-funded, well-resourced and had this, this uh, top people at the top of the pyramid driving it. Uh, and that is not to insult anybody among our volunteers who are in officerships, are in coaching areas, or managerships, or whatever. It is just, uh, and just to qualify. And all welcomed them with open arms, Kevin. That's oh, indeed. Indeed. Would, indeed. There's, there's indeed. nobody indeed. Um, jealously guarding their turf here, I don't think. Yeah. In that respect. yeah. I, I know, and I've, I, I'm very familiar with that, that uh, reality, Mikey, uh, where people said, Gee, you know, here in Roscommon, we formed um, the, uh, the Rossies, uh, oh, the Club Rossi. Um, to take all that fundraising pressure off, off the officership. And it has been an amazing success. And please God, in time, will dribble down uh, in, real, in real terms. But to go back to the last point, I just wanted a, a tiny, a one-liner with it, Mike, if you give me the, the mm -hmm. 20 seconds first. The, the idea of bringing Crow Park outside, sorry, Dublin outside Crow Park, I, I am not for a second suggesting that um, they would not continue to be beating teams. But my personal experience has been that the gap narrows significantly. So the 24, 25, 26 point beatings that, you know, when I brought Roscommon teams up to, up to Crow Park, you go down to, we play them in the league and the win with a last minute point or whatever, or the win by four. You go up to Oma to play Tyrone. Dublin weren't handing out any hammerings up in Oma. 
uh, or Donegal, or Don, maybe Castle Bar the odd night, but on like it's not known as John said for as home advantage for nothing. There is yeah. a reason it is. Um, if, if nothing, just for familiarity. So I just make that point. I'm not suggesting Dublin yeah. would all of a sudden fall off. The cliff. That's that's not a fair point. And I just I just don't see it overturning what we what, what we have here. And I know you're not suggesting it is, but it's incremental. Um, Connor, I, I I'm I'm minded of a, a quote from Gregory McGonagall. He was quoted by Kieran Shannon last year, just talking about the population. I remember once hearing that Russian boxing only needs one in ten thousand to become a world contender, whereas Ireland needs one in every five. For a Derry or a Monaghan to have a good county team, you need every club to produce a county player in Dublin, it only has to be one in every three clubs. It's, it's, it's poetic, but there's probably some mathematical justification for it. And if splitting Dublin isn't an option, then giving the other advantages that they have, and in this case here where you talk about home advantage is one and the other one is financial, giving, that, well. advantage, yeah. um, giving that advantage to other counties is that the only? Have you any other solutions other than what what John is suggesting? Basically, defund Dublin and fund the rest, and and hope that can overturn what's just, becoming I, a. I, I, okay. I, I, sorry, just happened. I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying defund. Dublin. Okay, I've been a little bit glib. Yeah. There will there will be clubs in Dublin like your Geraldines that you mentioned earlier, and your your Ranelagh like Gales, who absolutely will need this funding. What I'm saying is to redistribute the money from the clubs that can afford to pay for their GPO okay. and etc. and their strength and condition officers themselves. Okay, so Connor, does that make sense to you, or would you have another idea? Do you think? No, well, look, do I have an, an idea? You need a million ideas, and you need to successfully implement yep. them all to have mm. any sort of tangible difference in this. But look, the one thing I'll say about the the quote from Gregory McGonagall, and um, like, I could sit here now and tell you that um, it's unlikely that Dublin are going to produce another Brian Fenton, another Kieran Kilkenny at the same time. But I'd I'd have told you five years ago that it was unlikely they were going to produce somebody to replace Dermot Connolly and Paul Finn and Bernard Brogan all at the same time. So I think if, if, if our focus is hoping that Dublin disimprove, I don't think that's really the proper yeah, way to go yeah. about this. You know, like now it's not a healthy I, way to go about no, it. Anyway. I would I would make this point, and I know this isn't I know this isn't really the point, but I would make the point that I'm not sure that any county has ever enjoyed a succession of managers as good at their job as Dublin have with Pat Gilroy, Jim Gavin, and Desi Farrell. Um, and you know. It, it's important. That comes back. That comes back to your CEO again, though, does it? Yeah, not, it Connor? does. And even like you know, like yeah, it does. And Desi Farr would have obviously got involved at under eleven. And this is Kevin made this point as well. Dublin harnessed all the expertise. I went through it for a piece because this year was supposed to be the the jubilee of the Dublin team from nineteen ninety five. Now it wasn't a particularly celebrated team as far as all Ireland winning teams go. Um, but if you go through <laughs> the the contribution that that team has now made to Dublin football at all levels from a very, very young age. Now, it's easy for them to make that contribution because they know that they're going into a system that would support them. And that's what kind of getting back to Kevin's point. There are counties out there that don't have any of the natural advantages that Dublin have, that don't have anywhere near the population and still can't harness what expertise exists in their county because mm. those people mm. won't engage. So that's what I'm talking about. Like, there's a million ways to improve other counties a million and I think that's the area that needs to be focused on because if we're waiting for Dublin to come back to the pack even if we went nuclear and sort of chop you know turn the pyramid upside down of the development coaching model it's not actually going to have any immediate tangible effect 10 years so, yeah. so yeah. I, I, I think what you're looking at is uh, uh, you know like, like what happens in, in, in sort of division 3 division 4 counties like if you look at their lifespan really what happens is occasionally a good crop of players will come around at the same time and they'll get a brief kind of elevation in, in the level they compete at. Or occasionally a really good manager will come along and bring them to a level that's probably exceptional, you know, regarding comparison to their own history. But they fall back then to a level because the structure isn't there to support it, to, to make a it's it, it, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a level of sustainability. I spoke to somebody the other day about this um, and they're involved in their own county and they made the point about own Merchant, right? And I won't say which county it is, but he, he said, our county at underage level, they go out to win titles. So they go out to win the under 14 cup or whatever that is that they compete against other titles. And they do. But what that means is that they go around, and this is just one strand of it, right? Because, so what that means at, at, at under 14 level is they pick a lot of big guys. So, because they can win matches at under 14 level. He said if Owen Merchant was from his county, he wouldn't even be playing football at this stage. So, like, like you're talking about expertise all through the, 
the grades, all through the levels, like a pathway for players to make it from an underage level to a senior level, and also to make Gaelic football at inter-county level appealing. Because, you know, just reading Bernard Brogan's book last year, the extent to which he pushed himself to get a spot in the 26 for a game that he wasn't even going to come on, like, you're only really going to go to those levels if you think that you're going to have success. And look, if you were from a county that's going to play Dublin in the first round of the Leinster Championship next year, it would be hard to put yourself through six or seven months of um, yeah, six or seven months mm, of glue to, to, to get yeah. to that level, unless your manager was making hard time. Uh, Connor, are, can I just make one point on the Jeffrey McGonagall <laughs> Russian boxer uh, quote? And I said this to you, Rory, uh, a lot of times. Uh, what was a one in three? Uh, yeah, that's, that's that, what yeah. he comes up with. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I'll turn that on its head now. What about Cork? With two hundred and fifty-six clubs, and yet they're a good bit behind. How many? You know, how many good players do they need from how many clubs every so often? You know. Yeah. Well, it, it, well no, it's, it's not. Point, it's not yeah. linear. This is not linear. It, there's. It, 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 it's. There's so many complexities to this. Uh, yeah, and the, and, the and one, as Connor the, said, there's a million the, solutions. Yeah. But we have to find yeah, and it, five or yeah. six quick it, ones. Yeah, and, and just it, Connor, it, wait, it, just to, I, it, it like, is complex. Sorry, John. John, can I just make well, one point well, there? Ahead, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to defend Cork in any way, shape, or form. Here, uh, you I'm probably just, are I think it's, one, anyway. But, but no, I'm not. But I just, I, I think it's, I think it's actually an important point in a broader context. Like Paddy Kelly once said to me, he said, like, and this comes back to the funding situation, right? Now, look. I think, look, the figures are put out there every year. The Cork County Board don't, you can't, they don't make any secret of it. Um, it's usually averaging between about 1.4 and about 1.7 million is what's spent on Cork inter-county teams, minor, intermediate, sorry, minor, under 20 and senior hurling of football. And Dublin is usually roughly the same. It's usually roughly the same. It's not much more. Dublin would go deeper into the football championships at times. So maybe it's a little bit more. But Paddy Kelly would often say to me, he said, Rory, like the 40% of what we're spending is mileage. No, no, so that you're talking hundreds, hundreds of thousands of euro, hundreds of thousands of euro here yeah, now, yeah. spent spent on mileage alone, which Dublin don't have. But Dublin are still spending the same levels on the preparation of their teams. So what are they spending it on? Yeah, they don't have a state. They don't have a stadium. They don't have a stadium to finance. But, yeah, what's that, John? Right. So just on, on the Cork situation. So that's that's money spent on a yearly basis to prepare their teams, which is broadly on a par with what uh, Dublin spent. That's 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 not up for debate. And as well, Cork got more capital grants funding than Dublin, I think, when I checked the 2018. Uh, Quaive, yeah. And that was the to obviously uh, finished Parky Quaive. But we're, what we're forgetting here, right, and, and you can say Cork are a sleeping giant, but from the period that I quoted in my, uh, in my letter, they received 10 times less games development funding than Dublin. Like, so that's where the disparity is. That's where the, the glowing disparity is. And, and Connor, to touch on a point that, that you made, you're, I, I completely agree with you that Dublin have the structures in place that, right, they can go to Kieran Wheel and they can go to ex-players and get them involved at underage and get the top uh, coaches and, and, and people involved, right? They have those structures in place, okay? But what we have to remind you is those structures weren't in place when Dublin were struggling and, and, and Sean Kelly's committee was set up and John Costello was brought in. The GAA funded and helped put those structures in place. Structures, structures to help them hold on to that kind of talent. Structures to set up a high-performance environment. Now, all we're asking across the country is that the GAA come and help the other countries that are struggling to put in place those structures, to help fund those. That's, that's, that, that's what it comes down to. And every single time, like we, we, can say, we can say that games development funding doesn't matter and it's not going to change anything. And I completely accept that it will take 10 or 15 years to change it. But if it's yeah. not going to change it, then what an awful waste of money over the last... 20 years. But, and John, can I just add to that, um, and I'm making the point there, I don't know if it was picked up or not, that if you look at Mayo, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know, I know it's of the order of 15 millions. Um, Galway, Cork now, obviously with Parky Creeve, etc. Massive stadium debt. Massive, massive stadium debt or centre of excellent debt. Tens uh, of millions. In, yeah. yeah. And, and, and then, just by nature of where they're located, Crow Park, 
is ready to go, just yeah. Dublin pay the rentals, or Leinster pay the rentals, or whoever is the, is the tenant yeah. on, on the night. Now we're getting there, Kevin. Now we're getting there. It's, the, it's at the heart of everything, as much and all as we might not want to admit it. Like, population is obviously a huge thing, but the funding is at the heart of, of everything. Like, mm. if you look at what extreme measures Mayo have had to go to, to fundraise, like, I mean, I, I've, I've read newspapers about some bizarre... Uh, financial brokerage stuff in, in London. I, like, I, I, this is just what I read in the papers. Like, uh, Roscommon County Board are probably the best fundraisers that I've ever... Sorry, Club Rossi, probably mm. the best fund, fundraisers. Outstanding, yeah. Well. Like, the, the Buy a House. Uh, like, St. Bridget's Club in Roscommon are phenomenal fundraisers. Clubs and Dublin don't have to be distracted by that to the same degree. And they can then focus, like you've said on, right, let's get great people in place that we make sure that we maximise where we're spending this money. Like, yeah. mm. Dublin don't, Dublin clubs, sorry, Dublin, the super clubs in Dublin and Dublin County Board don't have to worry about that. And, and for, every, for every super club, as you say, for every Kula and for every Kilmacud, there are vast swathes of Dublin still where GA doesn't really, hasn't taken a foothold. I, I, the people say Finglas doesn't have uh, near as many clubs or as teams as the population would say and even parts of rural Dublin like up towards you Rory, Balbriggan Balbriggan is still really considered a soccer town and it's a population of about 25,000 well. people and it's got one GA club if you consider the town outside of Dublin uh, of 25,000 it has more than one GA club mm. so um, I don't argue with you at all John that the funding is an issue of course it is, you'd have to be mad to think it's not the, but the argument is that, uh, yeah, it is trying to find the mechanism by which you can say you can treat a Finglas the same as you would treat a Westmeath, if you know what I mean, and ignore your, uh, your super clubs, as you say. And, and you, you almost need to get down to the granular in Dublin and say, let's not treat Dublin as Dublin. Let's treat these smaller clubs in, in, to kind of marginalise GA areas. Let's treat them. Let's give them the funding. Where and then take the funding away from the super clubs and plow it down the country where it's needed to the commuter belt and beyond in Leinster. It, well, if, if we're talking just about 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 fairness, like, and, and we can really break this down and make it really simple, and I'll, I'll kind of put it to the floor. So, would anybody think that it's fair that um, at Loan GA, um, with a membership of seven hundred euro, they charge a uh, hundred and twenty euro for a family membership? Is it fair? that they would have to pay the same amount uh, towards the salary of a games promotion officer as Kilmacud, who have a, a membership of €4,800 Euro, and their membership is three times uh, that of Athlone. Is that fair? No, no. It, it, it was fair. It was a good idea back when Dublin was, a, was, was struggling, as you say. But I think everybody would admit that the plan has worked. The issue here is the plan has worked too well. Um, but... We'll, we'll finish up now soon because I think we have all made our points pretty strongly. But Kevin, it, gets, it just comes back to that, that. Can the same model work everywhere else? But, or was the Dublin plan, was, it few, was, was the money like the ignition to the fuel that is the obvious population? Go, my, my, I don't have a problem with your plan, John. My only problem yeah. is that I just don't think you will have the same effect outside Dublin, personally. I, Not I, a reason I think to it, do it, though. yeah. I think a big thing, a big part of the Dublin thing, and, we, and, and this is where we have to give them massive credit. And whoever was the instigator, whether, you know, whether it was John, John Costa, our, our like-minded people, you know, they might have had outstanding officerships, uh, officership around that time. Whatever the reason, to just use a kind of a, 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 a they got their act together. They absolutely got, and then there was the coming together, that perfect storm, there was the coming together of getting their act together, having a top CEO installed and then the money coming down the tracks and wisely used. Now, you know, now that's a loose phrase I used, got their act together or copped on. But I think we'd all agree that there is massive room in a lot of county boards to get their act together. To certainly... The point, the point is, Kevin, I'm sorry, I don't mean to hog the debate. But no, the you're okay. Work away, John. They funded and helped Dublin County Board in getting their act together. That's yeah, but get, but, but, get, but before the funds come, a lot of the time you have to get your act together before the funds will come. Yeah, that, that won't just fling it out to you. That's, that's the first point. The, the, the appointment of, of somebody to, to 
ensure that that money is spent. I absolutely agree with you there. Mm. That the first thing is we need to ensure that county boards, when provided with the funds, will spend them correctly. But the G, like we can't really get it twisted. The GAA funded and helped, and and the taxpayer funded and helped Dublin County Board to appoint John Costello and for them to get their act together. And mm. how, how many counties? How many count Connor? You'll probably know this. How many counties have CEOs? Of the 32 counties? I don't know off the top of my head, but it's only a handful. Yeah. Like, it's only six or yeah. seven, I think. You know? I, would, I would have thought so, yeah. Yeah, yeah I would have thought so. And, and look, that's, you know, I, I, just on, on that point as well, uh, sorry, I meant to read this out earlier on, but just, just give you an illustration of the, the structural issues that a lot of county boards face. And this is why I think Crow Park would be reluctant to merely start writing checks. And it comes back to John's point as well about giving county boards help rather than just money. But that report that was commissioned uh, in 2016, and this is only four years ago, and basically... Um, this, is on the, this is on the hurling money, is it? Yeah, there was 200,000 yeah, yeah. um, per, per, per county, and, and the idea was to get from, from tier two to tier one. So it's a sort of a comparative um, goal, if you want to call it that, with yeah, what yeah. a lot of Leinster counties would be making. So the findings, and these were published, so I can read them out, but it just said... Um, Key stakeholders and the interviews that they conducted were with county board officials and managers of minor under 21 and senior in the county. And, they, and what they found was key stakeholders did not appear to possess sufficient knowledge or awareness of both long and short term outcomes in order to manage the funding in such a way as to bridge the gap between tier one counties. In many cases, senior managers, county board officers and staff stated that they had an adequate understanding of the basic elements of high performance. Now, they go into much more granular detail mm. about what that comprised. But I think that kind of shows where we're at in a lot of county boards. That's not to disparage the efforts of anybody in a county board. As I said, they've enough to be doing with organising fixtures and all the other things that go hand in hand with that. But one of the recommendations that this, uh, this uh, investigation made, um, and I'm just going to find it here, just bear with me. Um, they said that um, the GAA essentially should build its own technical expertise base by employing people with the required skills to design, manage, monitor, and deliver effective programs for, uh, to support our amateur players and coaches. And that's what I would imagine is the, would, would be the, I know I don't know to what extent. But this Starting would, point. But I would imagine that this would be the, the, the path that would get you the furthest along the road in the quickest way possible. Now, there's funding that has to go into that. There's no doubt about that. You're not going to employ a lot of high-performance coaching experts and they're going to do it for nothing. So funding has to go into there. And there is a point to be made as well that in a year when the GAA has made basically no money uh, and are unsure as to when their revenue streams are actually going to start to flow again, I would imagine that all aspects of funding and all elements of where they direct monies are up in the air at the moment. Uh, but, I could, but I would imagine that if you're looking at a situation where, okay, just take Leinster, and by, you know, we're only discussing Leinster because they're the counties primarily affected by how good Dublin have become. But even geographically, like given the way that the counties are situated beside each other, you know, it would have to be, I would imagine, some sort of pooled way of um, improving and even developing structures for a pathway for players and how to train them and how to, and even to oversee coaches. Like with the best will in the world, you can have GPOs employed in every county but unless somebody is actually there to find out whether they're doing good work bad work or indifferent work it's not really going to get you too this, far this comes back to something that we had an interview with Niall Ronan the former Munster player um, who's now obviously in as SNC with me GA and he said um, he said you just couldn't get over the lack of oversight and just the, like how you can get your coaching badges in GA compared to how you get them in rugby is just night and day so there's something in that John we gave the first word to you and we'll give the last word to you um Everybody here seems to be keen for a solution for this, but you can even see between five people here, there's absolutely no agreement on, on what, what that um, solution should be. You, you've, you, you've restarted the debate here, and as I was saying to you before we came on, you've managed to do that during the season, and it's not usually when this debate happens, so this is interesting. So there, there might be a little bit of a groundswell here, we don't know, and as Connor says, every, the GA, everything's going to be up for decision now because, you know, Everything, incomes are changed, expenditures are going to have to be changed, everything is going to be looked at. What would you like to happen next? Not in five years or in 10 years, like in the next 12 months, what step do you think needs to be taken to, as you say, save the Leinster Football Championship? 
Um, well, well, look, I, there's the, the short answer to that is there's nothing that can be done immediately to save the Leinster Football Championship. What we need to do is try and um, put measures in place that possibly in 10 or 15 years that other counties in Leinster are in a position to compete again, possibly for Leinster. But more, more immediately, those across the country, like we need to put in measures that to ensure that the All Ireland series doesn't go the same way Leinster has gone, that the um, club football doesn't go the same way, that um, ladies football doesn't go the same way as Leinster. And for me to really get to that, we the the, the major disparity between Dublin, the, the population thing is obviously a, a, a huge advantage. That's a natural advantage, but the 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 man created advantages are the funding. In, as I said in my letter in 2003 and, and the late 90s into the early 2000s, the GAA just said that Dublin was in crisis and we needed strong GAA presence in, in the capital. And that has, 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 that has worked beyond measure to the point where, where, where it's a, a bit of a juggernaut now. I'm just asking for the same urgency to be shown to every other county around mm. the country so that we can try and bridge the gap. <clears throat> It might take 10, 15 years. It might not happen. But if we stand by and don't actually do anything, where are we going to be in 10 or 15 years' time? Mm, fair point. Fair well point. said. We will, well said, yeah. We will leave it at that. Um, very interesting debate. As I said, you've got five people here who probably agree on most things and can't agree on this. It's, it's, com it's complicated it's, issue. It's a complicated <laughs> issue. And um, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure we'll be pilloried from every side for not asking or not considering something or other, but sure... Oh, we'll All we could do is discuss this with the knowledge that we have. And I think everybody's done that very honestly. So I'll say thank you to, to John, to Kevin, to Connor, and to Rory. And um, we'll Cheers, be back guys. next week to um, talk about the All-Ireland football semifinals, um, where hopefully Dublin will be best. Ah, uh, Mayo. <laughs> where, <laughs> <laughs> where hopefully we have two very close games played in Crow Park. I uh, look forward okay. to a final in Crow Park because that's where they're going. <laughs> okay, guys. All right. Thank you. Cheers, that's nice to see you. All the best. Bye. by winning the last two matches on the road and that's not going to be taken away from us. What I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it, he hits it, it's over the bar! 